tuning into the Inner Revolution podcast. My prayer today is these words will speak to you where you live and create lasting change. Hey friends, want to consider a thought about comparison today. This is a big word in our world and in our relationships, and a lot of comparison happens in our mind. And Paul writes about this in 2 Corinthians 10, 12 through 14. He writes, we do not Uh, We do do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves when they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves. They show their ignorance. We, however, will not boast beyond our limits, but only with the field of influence that God has assigned to us, a field that reaches even to you. We will not overstep our bounds as if we had not come to you. What's he saying here? There is a, uh, a tendency where we can look at results and then compare if we're successful or not, effective or not, uh, valuable or not, wanted or not. And this is a real danger. The Apostle Paul is saying we do not measure ourselves with ourselves, but we go higher. We measure ourselves according to the person of Jesus Christ in this sense where he's our measuring line. Because the truth of the matter is God has given you and I special gifts and a unique ability to demonstrate and represent him. So when we look at another person and we say, hey, am I as amazing as that person? Or, boy, I wish I was like that person. Or, man, I'm thankful I'm not like that person. When we do that, we are trying to measure the immeasurable. We The plumb line then becomes something inferior. You know, I was talking with a brother recently, and we were talking about just uh, about trees. And when you look at a tree in, uh, in the summertime, in the spring and summer, as it's coming to life visually, uh, it's amazing to see the green and the buds, and, and it's really beautiful. But then you look at that same tree in the wintertime, and it almost looks dead. But the arborists say that the tree is more alive in the winter than it is in the spring and summer. And what do I mean by that? I mean that there is so much going on internally in that tree preparing for the next season. Certainly in both seasons they're alive, but there's much more going on when it looks dead, when it looks in its hibernation mode. And I just would say that today, do not enter into the world of comparison. It's very easy to walk by sight. And Paul is saying, we are not going to measure ourselves by ourselves. We're going to go beyond our limits and extend ourselves based on who Christ is, what Christ has said, the promise And you know what? If we see results or not, if we see a fruit or harvest or not, we're not going to judge ourselves and say that somehow uh, we're not good enough, we're not doing enough, or we're not amazing enough. This is really a ploy from the devil. I was uh, reading one writer who said that when we compare ourselves uh, with ourselves, we enter into a mythical self mythical self, which means we start to put pressure on ourselves to perform. We start to put pressure on ourselves to be something that we're not. We start to have unrealistic expectations and uh, unattainable expectations for that matter. And then pressure comes in. And then all of a sudden our joy is gone and we're so consumed with an image or a mythical uh, status that we're supposed to uh, attain to, that we lose our joy, we lose our ministry in this sense where we forget exactly what God has called us to do and what our specific role is. And I think that's important, especially as leaders, as ministers, that we're not called to do everything. We're not called to be everything. We can't be 100%, 100% of the time. So what is God called you to? What is your ministry? What is your role? Stay in your lane, as they say. Just as we're driving down the street, we want to stay in our lane so that we don't crash into oncoming traffic. 
Comparison takes us out of our lane. Comparison really causes us to overthink. Comparison causes us to be introspective, which is uh, a myoptic kind of mindset where it's all about me, self-orientation. Am I doing enough? And this is where the devil really takes advantage. Am I doing enough? Uh, that deficit motivation can really uh, stress us out. And God has said, I have not called you to be stressed out. I've called you to enjoy me. I've called you to uh, do what I have called you to do and to do it with all your heart. So Paul is saying we do not classify or compare ourselves with those that think there's something great. And uh, don't you uh, enjoy the uh, the Pharisee, and I say that with sarcasm, that, man, they're just talking about themselves, how great they are and what they've done. And I don't know about you, as Proverbs says, the faithful man who can find anything about himself that he can testify outside of the glory and grace of God. Let another man praise you. And that's a very good principle. So today, as we're thinking about comparing ourselves, what mirror do you look into? You know, James 1 21 through 24, we can be a forgetful uh, a forgetful hearer by looking into the mirror and not acting on what we see and what we hear. So what do I mean by that? What is the mirror? Uh, James talks about the perfect law of liberty being the Bible. Like we look at our image, we look at our person, we look at our place, and we say, God, uh, I live today for the audience of one. I'm not going to compare myself with someone that's more gifted. You know why? Because when we do that, when we start to compete with one another, we begin to ultimately criticize. So those are the three sabotage words. It's comparison, competition, and then ultimately criticism. So when we see someone that is uh, more gifted, more capable, more eloquent, uh, or even on the other spectrum, they're not as amazing. Or and we get that publican kind of mindset. I mean, that pharisaical mindset says, well, I'm more amazing than that person. That, so therefore, I deserve X, Y, Z. And then entitlement sabotages us. But when we look into the perfect law of liberty, the word of God, the finished work, the truth, the grace of God, we realize that everything is a gift and that what we're a part of is a gift. And by the grace of God, we could... Lose it all tomorrow if we're not good caretakers and stewards of the grace of God. But think about our our image. What are we looking at? A woman may look in the mirror and have body image uh, struggles. They she may look at another woman and wish this or that or or why am I this or that? Even a man very insecure because he does not know his value and purpose and identity in Christ. So comparison really can be uh, just a mythical uh, mindset where we are imagining a vain thing, and then we uh, live in ignorance because we're measuring ourselves by the inferior. So today, as you think about your day, go upwards, look upwards, um, have your focus be on the things of above in Colossians chapter 3, 2 and 3. Let it be those things that have you go beyond the measurable uh, and go into the immeasurable. And I think this is where, as Christians, the immeasurable life is really the faith life. We are looking beyond what we can see and we enter into the things that we don't see. You know, we see that in 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 7, it says, you know, one translation, it says, we obviously do not walk by sight, but we walk in faith. But one translation says that when we walk in what we understand, we do not walk in wonder. See, wonder, amazement, these are things that, again, cause us to look upwards. They cause us to uh, think big. They cause us to uh, respond to things that are beyond our measure. And this is what Paul is saying here. We are stretched beyond our natural measure. So, you know, this is a healthy thing for a believer, that personal expansion, this uh, this ability to say, I can't, but God, you can. And, and I think this is uh, the faith life where God says, you know, uh, 
I want to bring you into the can't so that you live in my can. Uh, because God is not interested in what we can do, but what we need him to do in our life. So again, uh, just as we're considering this thought, comparison, comparison, it, it can really be something that um, that can really take the wind out of our sails. You know, even, you know, even Paul said, I don't even judge myself. So you judging me is not a big deal in my life. He says, I have count in Acts 20, 24, I have not counted my life dear unto myself. What was his uh, default thinking about himself? He says, I am what I am by the grace of God in 1 Corinthians 15, 10. And when we have that mindset, I am what I am by the grace of God, then my identity is outside of performance. It's outside of influence. It's outside of whatever I'm looking at. Uh, But then it becomes an identity from above. The immeasurable now takes over the measurable. That's why results can be so fickle. They can be so uh, absolutely, um, you know, misleading in a lot of ways because we are only seeing one dimension. We're only seeing what we understand. And that's the danger of comparison because we are leaning on our own natural understanding. So in prayer, it shows us the second and third dimension. It shows us, okay, what we're a part of and what God is doing. So as we enter beyond the sight and we enter into wonder, we start to see that the work of God is not quantifiable. The work of God is not measurable. The work of God is so much more than what we can understand and see right now. This is interesting too, like when you're investing in somebody, uh, you know, you may think to yourself, you know, wow, I don't see much response. I don't see much of a uh, of a reward here. But, you know, it, things take great time and people may come to, um, you know, may come to life later. But your investment, your uh, ministry of the word is, is an ongoing ministry. And just like a, a seed takes time to break down in the earth and... Um, you know, for you know, it's fertilized. Germ- there's the germination. There's all this great work that happens in the unseen, and then all of a sudden, there's a shoot, and then there's a growth. And this is this is an important thing to say: is that things take time. So, the instant impact that we're used to in our Western culture, you know, this is not a drive through Christianity where things are instant impact. It may take time, weeks, months, years. So, when we see Uh, someone else and maybe uh, we see great fruit or great um, numbers or we see uh, instant impact, we have to say to ourselves, okay, there's three seasons. There's sowing, watering, and reaping. And maybe they're in the reaping stage. Maybe I'm in the sowing stage or you're in the watering stage. And and all three stages are very important. You know, we sow the seed by faith. Maybe it's a word. Maybe it's an act of kindness. Maybe it's a, um, again, maybe it's a, a, a word of encouragement or exhortation. And then there's a watering. There's a season where there's tribulation and there's a shaking and a settling in First Peter 5.10. And then all of a sudden there is a reaping eventually where um, there's a maturity. So again, another reason f- to watch comparison is everyone may be in a different season. Maybe they're in a season of harvest. Or maybe we're in a season of harvest and another person's in a season of sowing or, or, or watering. So we don't want to judge, thing, be, judge things before it's time in Galatians 4.4. 4. We want to be sensitive to, uh, like Paul is saying, uh, we want to be looking and coming to a conclusion based on Christ and not what we understand by sight. Now, granted, um, results are edifying. Uh, numbers are edifying, but they can also be misleading. You know, Paul says, I'd rather speak a few words with understanding than thousands of words in 1 Corinthians 14 without any understanding or experience. And this is, this is also important. Like comparison again is really where is the relationship in what I'm doing and, and what God is doing in me. So going back to that analogy about the tree, you know, the inner work of the heart, the hidden work of the heart, this is so valuable because 
God is preparing you for what's coming next. God is preparing you for the blessing. He's preparing you for the trial so that we can be effective. We can experience uh, our faith, but also we can persevere through and not just, um, you know, be like a spiritual yo-yo going up and down emotionally. Well, I love what Paul is saying here. He says, I'm not going to boast about myself. And and I guess that's a good point to say, you know, in the in the corporate world, people will leverage people for their gain. And that's a tremendously damaging thing in the spiritual world when we use people. We set people up for failure uh, when we build our works on their backs. But actually, the example we see with Christ is that he was a people builder. He was one that was in the moment with the person. He cared about the person. He spoke to the person. He was loving the person. And then the work of God happened through the love of God and ministry of the Spirit in that person's life. So today as we build churches or we minister, it's not that we are building churches on people. We are loving people. We're building people. And then the work of God is happening based on God's will or God's way. You know, you look at the book of Acts. I mean, uh, Acts chapter 2 through 4, the church was built and people were added to the church as God saw fit. And that's very interesting too. Again, you know, you may look at your church or your ministry and say, oh, I have just a small ministry. Well, actually, that is not true because regardless of numbers, Christ is still the head. And if Christ is the head, then uh, the work of God is is a work of God. And again, uh, be careful how we uh, just measure ourselves by ourselves. This is such a discouragement. And again, when we surround ourselves with more gifted people, more capable people, then the work of God is so enjoyable. But if I'm competing, if I'm trying to be better or trying to do better or trying to sound better, then there's a striving and then ultimately we stop receiving from that person because we're trying to be better than that person. So you can just see how uh, this negative thoughts can come in, these negative addictions we could call them where we're so much needing the praises of men. And you know that insecurity is so insatiable where words will never be enough, actions will never be enough. God has to satisfy that that depth in us to say, hey, you are, uh, you are uh, beautiful, you are capable, you are significant, you are wanted, you are uh, made in my image. So uh, when we compare ourselves with ourselves, we again, we replace the image of God with a mythical expectation or a mythical image. And uh, I like that thought about mythical, because when you look at the myth, it's like, you know, there's shows out there that debunk myths, like it's the idealistic view of something. It's the fantasy of how things should be. And uh, really, uh, if you look at history and you look at missionaries in general overseas or, or even nationally, and their mission life was, uh, in some cases, not very glorious, and in some cases, not very fruitful by sight. Think of Adoniram Judson, that uh, he had very few con- uh, converts, and then he translated the Bible in Burma, and then after he passed on, the fruit came in like droves. And you know, if he was to compare himself with other missionaries, he may have quit. He may have said, well, you know, this is not working or I'm not doing something right. But he did what he was called to do. And God says, I will use that for my glory. And uh, and, and after he passed, uh, the fruit was, uh, was exceptional. He transformed the nation of Burma. You know, I think of Will- William Borden. Here's another good example. Borden Milk up there in New England. Young man, affluent family. He is uh, groomed to take the family business. And then, um, you know, God touches his heart about missions. He's in a meeting. He hears about missions and he tells his family, I'm going to go to Africa and I'm going to just minister the gospel. And, you know, what was he comparing himself to? Was he trying to be a businessman or an affluent um, 
successful man, maybe, but it changed. He began to compare himself with the, his eternal self or his, uh, the image of God. And he went out in faith, parents in disbelief, but he went out in faith. And in his travels, he stops in, um, in Egypt, I believe it's Alexandria, and he contracts spiral meningitis. And the voyages back then were pretty grueling, and he dies on the way to his mission. And someone might say, oh, what a waste of a life. He had a bright future. He had uh, affluence. He had uh, power, privilege, position. And then all of a sudden, he throws it all away because he wants to pursue God and obey God and the conviction that he put in his heart. Well, what's interesting is the news writer writes about this tragedy in his eyes and just shares about you know, what a waste of a life. And actually it backfires because when people read that story, there was a hundred men that took his place and they were uh, part of the interior work in Africa uh, in later years, these hundred men that took Borden's place. So Borden, William Borden, he uh, seemingly uh, is a failure, uh, but in God's eyes, he was the seed that was put in the ground that died, that bore fruit for a hundred men that would eventually be thousands in the years to come. So we just can't look at things by sight. We have to say, okay, God, I want to measure myself in the finished work. I want to measure myself in love today. I want to measure myself in grace today. I want to measure myself in faith today. And the only way we can do that really is we get to know the anatomy of faith, the the anatomy of grace, the anatomy of love. You know, what is the ingredients? You know, when someone makes a cake, they have to have all the right ingredients. So, you know, faith motivated by love, faith, it's Christ's faith. It's a faith that moves mountains because we're living and agreeing in the promises of God. So this helps us uh, transcend the the self-orientation, the self-measuring, the self-ambition, the pride uh, that that really is so destructive and causes us to retreat. So just as I close today, just to encourage ourselves, uh, just like uh, this beautiful comment, I, comic, I always think of it, and it's a great illustration. There's a cat that looks into the mirror and the reflection is a lion. You know, let that be your reflection today. What's your reflection today? Is it who you are right now, or is it who you are being made to be? And that's a very good exercise in our heart to say, okay, Lord, I am what I am by the grace of God. And this is a great way to treat people. It's a great way to look at people, not in who they are now, but who they will be or who they are in their potential. And by the way, when we say potential, it's really Christ's ability in us. So, You know, we may look at someone and they're just, uh, you know, a mess, but we find that 1% or that 2% or that 5%, that little flicker of health, and we invest 100% of our attention there. And then what happens is it grows and it becomes something that eventually will take over all the other, uh, the, all the other infectious areas. So just to encourage our hearts today again, that, um, what are you looking at? What are you concluding? What is your critical thinking? What is your um, what is your measuring line today? Let it be something from above. And uh, really, uh, like Paul said, we went beyond ourselves because of love. And uh, no matter what our plan is or what our idea of success is today, uh, enjoy God. Enjoy yourself uh, in God. When you look at yourself, reflect back on the image of how Christ has made you to be. In Psalm 139, 14, you are beautifully and wonderfully made for his glory. Amen. Thanks, friends, for joining us for another episode of the Inner Revolution podcast. Please find us on Facebook, Instagram, and YouTube, and subscribe so that you don't miss an episode.